everybody. This is Stephanie Krupsack with the Pure Bound Living podcast. Today's guest, we have Michael Keenitz, photojournalist for over 45 years, featured in Life, Time, Newsweek, Audubon, L, Rolling Stone, and other major publications worldwide. His work has also been exhibited in museums and galleries in the United States and Europe. So thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're excited to get started, learn more about uh, what you do. So tell us a little bit more about your background as a photographer. Well, the way I got started was uh, I went to this went to school at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and almost daily there would be uh, protests, and I'd read about the protests the next day in the newspaper, and I didn't even recognize what I had personally witnessed. So I thought, I'm going to start carrying a camera and just documenting these sorts of things. And I studied political philosophy, so I was already interested in, you know, social movements and just political thought. And from there, I did 10 years of war photography for news magazines and photo agencies once I graduated from college. Oh, wow. And where were you for that, taking those photos? Oh, Lebanon, Afghanistan, okay. wow. Northern Ireland, uh, a lot of work in Central America. There were a lot of revolutions going on then. So uh, all over the world. Is there a certain location that impacted you the most that you witnessed? I'm sorry, what was the word you used? That the most, something before the most, impressed me? Impacted you the oh, most. Oh, impacted Yeah, me. of the like, war. I'd say it would have to be Afghanistan. It was like okay. going back 500 years. You know, the men ate separately from the women. Um, there were just so many cultural things that mm -hmm. seemed so different than our own culture not right or wrong just different and um, that was probably the most interesting country I've ever visited very neat I've not been there yet but we do share Madison in common <laughs> um, and I think we talked earlier about how I was responsible for tearing down some of the old buildings during yes, the wartime <laughs> one of the ugliest buildings on campus thank you very much for doing that <laughs> Yes, Union South, we're talking about. <laughs> so I know you talked a little bit about your experiences um, doing, you know, photography in Madison and different places overseas. Is there a specific experience that kind of led you to be a photographer, or would, you, would that be? Well, really, Madison? those what I had mentioned um, on my way to class in Madison, but all sorts of experiences that I've witnessed, and I've been pleased that I had a camera, like documenting death squad activity in El Salvador. And now, of course, something that impacts everybody in the world, climate change. So I think pretty much for the rest of my life, in some way or another, I'll try and work on that. Since not only is everybody impacted, but everybody in the world could probably do something to at least lessen what I think is probably going to be the inevitable uh, end of the earth because of just our lifestyle and how unsustainable it is given what it does to the environment yeah that you're capturing that and letting us kind of see that um, so what do you want people to take away from viewing your work well this particular exhibition I'd like them to go away with two things one that Iceland is an unbelievably beautiful and multifaceted country and then the other uh, aspect is all of this beauty that people will hopefully come and appreciate here at um, Art at Large, I hope they recognize that because of the way we are living that it's rapidly vanishing. Just mm -hmm. in 2018, a glaciologist discovered that the melt rate of the glaciers was as great in that year as the previous 10. So things are definitely accelerating. When I first went there, they had predicted worst-case scenario by the year, um, trying to figure out, 100 years would be 21. Yeah, and in less than 100 years, at the time it was 80 mm -hmm. years, it was predicted that there would no longer be glaciers in Iceland, and people were very skeptical of that. Now, as the models are updated because of the rapid melting, they're seeing that as more realistic than the previous assessment, which put it at about 200 years. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. So it's even faster. Yeah. Mm, that's quite scary. Dramatically so. And your exhibit here at Arts at Large is showcasing a span of five I, years? or uh, Yeah, five okay. years. Um, I started in 2013, and the reason I got interested in this was primarily I was walking with a guide one day, and we were near the glaciers on our way to them to walk on them. And um, he said, wait a minute, let me show you this. And he pulled out his iPhone, and he showed me the most beautiful ice cave. I mean, it's just so stunningly beautiful. And I said, wow, where is this? How can we see that? He said, it's where we're standing. It was where we are standing right now. Oh, two okay. years ago wow. and all that could be seen when I was there were boulders and small rocks the okay. ice had completely vanished Wow! Just so that kind of motivated me to that this was a very dramatic thing that by using photography could be communicated to to a lot of people it was kind of a and what I liked about it was on the one hand, you're showing this incredible beauty that exists there, and on the other hand, virtually none of it, none of what's pictured in this gallery still exists mm -hmm. in this period of time we're talking about, from 2013 to 2018. Wow, that's really um, unfortunate. I mean, these photos are beautiful, um, all these rock formations, or ice formations, um, and they're, they're not there anymore. So this is a way to preserve that and... Yeah, and one of the reasons I decided to print this stuff on aluminum, it's an archival process, and who knows, in 80 years, these photographs will be around, but the glaciers probably won't be. So children and other and previous or the next generations will be able to see, oh, that's what a glacier looked like. Yeah, oh gosh, <laughs> like on the, <laughs> on the extinction list. It's kind or, of like in our oh, own wow. country, Glacier National Park. At some point, relatively soon, they'll be changing the name. There's no longer really glaciers there. They're just shadows of themselves, what the, it once was there. And have you done photography there as well? No, but a friend of mine took her children there a couple of summers ago and was telling me just how dramatic really? the, okay. things have melted. And Wow. I've not been there. I've been to Yellowstone, but... Not a glacier. I was in Yellowstone chased by a buffalo on my bicycle. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. <laughs> that doesn't sound fun. <laughs> but you survived. You're here today. That's good. <laughs> a buffalo. Is there more to that story? <laughs> just Were you trying that, to photograph him? <laughs> no. I was just riding kind of slowly, admiring this buffalo. And it was near a young buffalo. And I guess oh, the road the passed buffalo. a little too close, <laughs> and all of a sudden, a cloud of dust, and this thing starts chasing me, and I rode pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I know you um, an answered this in a bit before, but like, how does your work impact the environment? By the bringing awareness to everybody and things like that? Yeah, first and foremost, it brings awareness, and I think the beauty, hopefully, will help I would like to think will help to motivate people to, in their own lives, figure out in some way, both at work and when they're not working, mm -hmm. ways they can reduce the carbon footprint and the overall uh, environmental degradation that's going on. Are there certain things that you'd recommend for listeners to incorporate into their daily lives to kind of help combat climate yes, change? Yes, look at your website. Oh, my website. <laughs> I found it absolutely excellent. It had several great ideas. But, you know, so many of these things, and one of the reasons why I think that in the end we're only going to be able to slow this process down, I think it's inevitable that the planet is just somewhat doomed. I mean, look at the, the bird life, the um, insects. I mean, they vanished in 30 years almost by 75%. Uh, we just can't, you know, there's, there's cycles, there's things that are necessary in the overall food chain, like pollination by bees, that's just so rapidly declining. The bat population, I remember as a child, you'd drive 20 or 30 miles, your car, the grill, the front windshield would just be covered with insects. Now, there's none almost all summer. The same thing with bats. I used to see so many of them flying at night. Now I don't see any because of that white nose disease. Mm, oh, yeah, things like that. 
I know um, a rhino is just officially on the no longer existing list. I think another um, type of parrot I saw recently. So it's, it's not good. Yeah. Yeah. The bird species, there's been a tremendous d- decrease in those. And I just read the other day that all the birds are now uh, becoming a little bit smaller in size, too. Yeah, I did see that as well. That's really interesting. And I know um, you mentioned your story about riding a bike. <laughs> Chased by buffalo. So is that one of your primary means of limiting your carbon footprint? I, I do ride uh, a bike a lot. I used to actually race bicycles. Okay. And um, I got a fat tire bike years ago for the winter. I want to try that. I, re- I was really impressed with the electric bikes that I used in Iceland to go to one of, through one of the national parks last year. Oh, okay. Which one? Um, the Vatna Yokel. Okay. It's kind of, it's the largest one. It's, you know, surrounding the glacier there, which takes up, depending on who's doing the measuring, 8 to 11% of the entire country. Oh, wow. It's a massive, that's, that's where mo- all of these photographs are from. And I got okay. tremendous because they were really behind the project support from the park staff to okay. fly my drone and do a lot of other things without permits the permits were just open once they discovered okay. what i was up to oh, that's and great. then in lieu of that i give them these photographs to use in any wish and mm-hmm. wi- in any manner they wish okay that's really great um and for listeners that are not familiar with iceland where on the, the like area of the country is this like which like south this would part? be the the southeast, southeast. coast okay and it's interesting the southeast coast the land because of the dramatic ice melt Unlike other parts of Iceland where the ocean depth is becoming uh, a factor, here the land itself is rising, so the ocean is actually lower in those areas. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, is that because of the ice is melting and the it's the, like bring, rising up? Exactly. Really? I've that, heard of that that's, too. that's a interesting. that's a good illustration of how dramatic and how much. It's also another thing that's very significant about Iceland is under those glaciers are volcanoes and with less and less ice the volcanoes scientists believe will become more active because there won't be that containment of those tons and tons and tons of ice and the cold temperatures okay wow i could just picture that like if the ice melts the weight's lifted and it rises (laughs) so i might have cliffs like in ireland (laughs) one day on the shoreline but um that's great and I've only explored the Golden Circle myself of Iceland, so closer to Reykjavik. But, um, yeah. And that area, that's like where the black sand beaches are, correct? The southeast yeah. corner? Okay. Very great. Um, yeah, I know these photos are great. So would you mind talking sure, about one of them? We're going to walk over. Let's talk about some of them. Yeah. So we're heading through the gallery at Arts at Large. So they're beautiful. Some of these are life-size. I think these two over here would be good to start with. Okay. The first one here is um, the end of the glacier. And these are pieces of ice Mm -hmm. that have broken off. They'd be referred to as icebergs. The process of actually Mm -hmm. breaking off is referred to as calving. Calving, okay. That's a new term. And um, this will dramatically change uh, all winter long in color. In the summer, what, this beautiful blue becomes white because the ice opens up due to the air. Oh, so that's why I liked going in the winter when you'd see the most dramatic blue color. Yeah, it almost looks like a rock. It's so blue, like a quartz. Wow, it's beautiful. Um, and to the right here, we see this large mountain face that's just rock now that was once glaciated as well as the glacier retreated from that there's these very very deep fissures that have resulted Mm -hmm. and they haven't allowed anybody to go hiking there now for a couple of years because they're afraid that whole side the fissures as they get deep deeper it's just going to collapse onto this existing glacier so they've asked hikers to stay away but recently they've discovered that the fissures aren't going as fast as they thought they would into and deeper into that uh, rock face. So they probably will allow hiking uh, to once again happen there. And several movies were um, produced here. um, And the Game of Thrones, a lot of scenes were shot in this area. I'd often encounter them when I was going around Iceland doing my (laughs) photography. 
Very neat. So were you in any of the films? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> well, this now, this, great too. this is a summer shot. And it's taken at 3.40 in the morning. And it looks when quite the, bright out. When the sun is rising, yeah. It never, even with the sun down in the summer, mm -hmm. it's still perfectly light. You wouldn't need a flashlight. So what time of year does that happen again? This would be, say, June, July. Okay. Um, all the hotels have very heavy blinds because you'd never be able to sleep because of how okay. light it is. Wow. So you have that 24-hour sunlight. Now, in the winter, when I like going more than the summer, you have the exact opposite. As I always like to say, I would rise early at 11.30 a.m. in the morning <laughs> along with the sun. Perfect and for then, night owl. <laughs> And then I'd work all day until the sun set, which is at 3.30 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So you basically had four hours to do okay. your work. But... The light was absolutely gorgeous because mm -hmm. it just sat on the horizon the whole day. Oh, so you didn't have to worry about it shadowing with it shifting. Exactly. Okay. It was just beautiful, warm light the entire mm -hmm. day. So even though it was just four hours of light, it was mm -hmm. the most gorgeous light you could ever ask for as a photographer. It's perfect. Yeah, this looks like... um. And like what we have here is a ice. massive piece of ice. Mm -hmm. Now, this has calved. It's floated down a very small stream. Mm -hmm. The big uh, lagoon that it floated down is called Jokersalan, and there's a little thin stream. And now, after flowing all the way to the ocean, the waves or the tide have thrown it back up on shore. Okay. And as massive as this is, which it's about the size of a car, wow. I photographed this as i said at 3 40 in the morning and by 10 a.m it was gone oh really because it had melted or? yeah completely okay. vanished wow very interesting and this is at um yokel salon beach yeah is what this, one this is would called? be okay. yeah now the yokel salon lagoon was f in the 1700s an aspen forest and a farmer's field now it's the deepest lake in iceland because of all the glacial melting wow that's that's crazy okay Wow. Yeah, and um, so a lot of trees. Aspen, yeah, it? and we mm -hmm. happened to find one in one of the entrances to one of the ice caves, and mm -hmm. they carbon dated it to be 4,000 years old. Oh, my gosh. Wow. You never would have thought that because in Iceland, it's not many trees at all, really. So. Yeah, they've been yeah. completely wiped out by the, largely by the glaciation. Okay. It's kind of ironic. They per reaches, recently purchased a number of trees, and uh, unfortunately, whoever put in the order to plant them all over Iceland didn't realize they were dwarfs, dwarf oh. trees. So they never <laughs> grew very much. Wow. That's another interesting fact, too, I did not know. So very nice. Should we move on so to let's one? talk about um, a couple of these where we have people actually in the shots. Oh, I like this one. Now, this is a, mm -hmm. a an ice cave, mm -hmm. and there was, a, uh, there was only a front and back so to speak and we're looking at somebody one of the guides i went with uh ascending inside the cave okay while we were in there there was a massive avalanche outside oh wow we're near where he is okay but thank goodness there was a very deep crevice between this ice cave mm -hmm. and the rest of the glacier so okay. Although Zero we thing. heard it and mm -hmm. the rumble was incredible echoing through this cave, oh, I bet. I bet you were it, <laughs> it didn't affect us at all because okay. it all went down into that very deep ravine oh, okay. that wow. separated the cave from the rest of the glacier. And what year was that? Um, this was just two years ago. Two years ago. And mm -hmm. again, that doesn't that area doesn't exist. Really, it's completely or gone. It's so dramatically okay. different, you'd never recognize it. That's too bad. It looks massive and it's gorgeous. It was a stunningly beautiful place to be in. So, did you have to do a lot of training to learn how to do like ice yes. climbing? Okay. Yes, I um, didn't know a thing, but I was lucky that again, there were a lot of people in Iceland, particularly the guides who were aware of this issue that I was trying to document. And so we would trade services. I would give them or produce videos and photographs for them mm -hmm. to sell their tours and things. Okay. And then they would give me what normally would have cost thousands of dollars to get to these places absolutely free, the trip. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. That's great. 
So here's another one where we see just one lone soul standing next to this very, very deep blue canyon. Is that you? No, that was another okay. guide okay. I was with. I was at the uh, end of the canyon taking mm -hmm. this picture. And that's Siggy there. He was uh, excellent. The thing I really enjoyed about him was he studied glaciology and so while we were hiking, he could explain some of the things that we were looking at. Okay. And um, he was deeply involved with, you know, documenting how glaciers move. Mm -hmm. Now, notice this really black pumice color. Yeah, That's a result that. of volcanic ash, which either just a few years ago or thousands of years ago is now embedded in the glacier. Nice. Oh, yeah. And when I was first having these printed at a lab in California, they called me and said, boy, we really have to do a lot of cleaning up here. There's <laughs> this, just, it's just, and I said, no, 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 please don't touch it. Yeah. Just leave the file exactly the way they are. And it doesn't even look real. It looks like a painting. It's just amazing. Yeah, but it's a photograph. <laughs> it looks like he's in a standing in a perilous location too, like not too far from the yeah, end of the... Yeah, but notice in his right hand he has his ice axe. And oh, you, he's keeping himself, okay. If he was to slide, mm -hmm. you turn around and you just jam that axe okay. in and then you won't move an inch mm -hmm. because it'll just go deep into the ice and that yeah. axe will protect him. Right. Plus we used like uh, two and a half to three inch crampons on the ice. Okay. So we had a really good grip. Oh, that's good okay wow yeah this one is gorgeous so how tall do you think or how um or the height of this glacier? that lagoon mm -hmm. um it's okay. a few hundred feet high okay wow. um and is this one it's still called there? this one is called the blue canyon yeah blue canyon. it's okay. considerably smaller mm -hmm. but i believe it's still there i okay. i'll be going back probably next winter and okay. i'll take a look and I, yeah, that's one of the it. other things about this um work that i've done is i now have benchmarks on all of these places and i'll be going back to kind of do photography for more or less the same place to show people okay. how dramatic the changes have been yeah to over the years throughout the years oh, that sounds great okay so we're going to look at a series now that shows the melt changes yeah this is uh, my f the first ice cave i ever z visited and probably one of my favorites it's called the waterfall cave really? and one of the reasons why it's so memorable to me is not only this incredible gorgeous ice and by the way the light comes through from what are called moulons which are holes in the glacier that go all the oh, way to the okay. top of the glacier yeah, it's like, it looks like it's glowing so you get snow and the most gorgeous light and eventually and also um very abrasive debris rocks and things and then okay. in the summer when the heavy rains come there's erosion and these rocks etch all of this ice in that oh, really that wild like way that's okay. why it looks like that Great. it's that abrasive debris that etches it primarily in the summer from the heavy rains okay right. so this is a series that so this would have been taken in january 2016 okay. just that entire cave a woman is looking up to that mulan and then in the very next one not even a year later, December. all that was left of that part of the cave is this. Wow, now, the like cave itself was 75 to 100 yards long, mm -hmm. and it, the middle of it completely vanished, and then there were just two segments. This would be the south end, where we still see the water flowing and a little yeah. bit of ice, but not even enough for that woman to be standing in the cave anymore. Okay. It, this ice is so low. Throughout the years before um, the climate has been considerably warmer, what is like the average expansion and shrinking of the typical ice cave? Is it always vary or is it? It, it always varies. Okay. And again, you have so many elements besides just climate change, the mm -hmm. primary one being volcanic activity. So oh, you okay. couldn't yeah. just say f a f or give a flat rate. Yeah. And the way, of course, a glacier forms is through snowfall and the snowfall becomes compacted if it doesn't melt first okay. and that compacted snow forms the glacier or adds to the existing glacier so if there's not enough precipitation then you don't have that growth well in the cold more and more in the winter in fact just the other day there's like pouring rain instead okay. of snow now yeah. even at high elevations okay 
So moving along, this would be the north end of that, what was once that massive cave. Oh, and all you can see true. here is just the arch. Yeah. That's all that was left the there. Arch. And the water is still flowing mm -hmm. through, but there's only an arch. And then the final scene mm -hmm. is just the glacial melt after the whole cave had more or less vanished. Wow, so all you have is that, the water. Yeah. It's actually even more dramatic than that because the actual cave was up here a bit mm -hmm. and it's just just pretty much rock and wow. a little bit of ice. That's this crazy. would have been what's called a glacial toe. It's a mm -hmm. very small extension of the glacier. So in the span of not even two years, a year and yeah. a half, it's completely gone. Yeah. So, wow. It's quite sad. I'm glad you captured it that we can... This was dramatically it. changed by an incredibly heavy rainfall, mm -hmm. which lower than the glacier was positioned were was the main Highway 1 and bridges, okay. and those were all washed out as well in that rainstorm. Okay. So it was very, very dramatic and heavy rain. That was in 2016? Yeah, uh, that would have been, I think, 17 or okay. 18 even, early in 18, okay. yeah. Wow, and has it been and repaired it, since then? The, the bridge, you can still see the old one, and they have kind of a semi-permanent um, okay. drive around, but... The main highway, there was no access um, for at least a couple of months. Oh, wow. Okay. Unless you had a vehicle with giant flotation tires and you could drive through the river. Okay. Wow. So are there certain areas of Iceland right now that listeners could visit to see any of the glaciers or... Yeah, th there are, and I strongly suggest that you go to areas where the glacial tongues are. The glacial tongue is the extension off of the main glacier. They're the most okay. interesting to look at. They're the mm -hmm. easiest to get to. And if you come to the exhibition, you'll see a map or a description of the areas in southeast Iceland that I went. Okay. Or you can also email me at my website, and I'll be more than happy to provide you information. I mean, it is shark-infested waters, my dear friends, when it comes <laughs> to tourism in Iceland. Okay. There are so many rip-offs, primarily emanating from Reykjavik. Okay. You want to go with a guide who lives in the actual area and is daily is on the ice and knows what's going on. Okay. Not somebody who doesn't know anything about the area and just you know, took a job as a guide to take people on a bus from Reykjavik yeah, okay. To southeast Iceland. That's fair. Good to know. Good tip. <laughs> so, yeah, it's beautiful. So, again, the exhibit is open through the end of December. Yes, so. December 31st, mm -hmm. I believe it closes. Mm -hmm. There's also a book of all the photographs that you can also purchase for $49. Okay. Yeah, we'll put a link to everything, too. So, definitely. Um, and I do have one fun question I'd like to ask you. So, you talked a lot about, about your background, so what inspires you to take photos? Is there a like mantra or personal theme song that kind of gets you going to start your, your work for the day? Uh, there's a couple. <laughs> Tho uh, those who do nothing make no mistakes. Mm -hmm. and okay, that's a very good one. And that's very, the, very true. <laughs> and the other one is the unexamined life is not worth living. Mm -hmm. We've got to start examining the way we live in this country and around the world if we're at all concerned about the impact of climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So I'm glad that you're sharing that with us so we can see what has been happening in Iceland, for one example. So. Th thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this exhibition. And I do greatly admire what you're trying to do with your website, which is to help people recognize what they can do to kind of slow down the progress of climate change. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, yeah, any little bit helps. <laughs> so, well, thank you again so much for your time today. You're, and you're most welcome. Your work is amazing. So, thank, thank you. you.